All right, before I start uh, preaching my sermon for this morning, um, I forgot to announce that we are going to have a baptism after the church service. So if you'd like to stick around for that, we'd love to have you uh, be here for the baptism. And if you are here and you're saved today and you've never been baptized, and, and I'll say biblically baptized or scripturally baptized, I encourage you to get baptized today. There's, uh, there's no reason not to. There's no reason to hesitate. And when I say scripturally baptized, I mean uh, it's by full immersion, um, not just a, a sprinkling. I, I know m me for one, I was baptized as a baby. Um, that where I had some sprinkling on my head, and um, that doesn't count. That's not, that's not a, a biblical thing. I mean, people do all kinds of things for the children, but the baptism demonstrates your belief in Jesus Christ. It is, you know, little babies can't put their trust in Jesus. So uh, if that's the only baptism you've ever had and you're saved today, I encourage you to get baptized. And then the other thing I just bring up, too, is that, you know, some people actually did get a, a proper baptism, but it might have been before you were saved. So, um, the, the, the condition that we see in Acts chapter 8 when Philip was speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch and the Ethiopian eunuch says, hey, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So he asked him, why can't I be baptized? There's water right here. And he said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he baptizes him. So um, I, I would just say this is that, you know, the, the, the prerequisite for getting baptized is you, you have to believe. And of course, that is the saving faith. When you put your trust in Jesus Christ, he saves you. Um, it doesn't make sense to get baptized prior to that. I mean, I know people do. I get it. Cause, you know, and sometimes people think they're saved and they get baptized. But um, just to make sure everything's settled, it's a great idea. Uh, just, just get baptized after you get saved. And we are happy to do that for you. You could do it today or any other day that you'd like to um, just talk to me about that and let me know. But we've got everything. It's going to be all set up right after service. And we've got a change of garments for you as well. So that all being said, let's get into the sermon. I don't know where I set my backup recorder down. Someone can find that recorder for me. One of the ushers, maybe you can find that recorder for me. I appreciate it. Um, not that big of a deal. We start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is a chapter that is, um, it talks a lot about the gift of being able to speak with other tongues. Thank you. And that's not what this sermon's about, but uh, I'm going to be focusing in on just the last verse of this chapter that says, let all things be done decently and in order. And that sums up this whole chapter because it's talking about, you know, hey, there's, you know, people are given the gift of being able to speak with another tongue. It means they can speak with another language. Okay, it's not just a bunch of gibberish or people just saying a bunch of random stuff that no one really knows what they're saying. Yeah. It's another language. Okay, it's a gift that God gave to the apostles to be able to do this um, and to reach more people ultimately. But what's happening then, and, and as churches are being established and you have people who are able to speak with other tongues, he's setting in order the way things ought to be done. And the, the principle that we get from this is from that last statement there. Hey, you know, this is the house of God, so everything needs to be done decently and in order. And it's okay if there were more than one person that wants to preach. There's people who have things that maybe God's revealed to them, God's laid on their heart, you know, and they want to be able to speak. But you can't just have people just speaking out of turn and just kind of having a free-for-all when it comes to the service. There needs to be order in the service. Things need to be done decently. It needs to be done in order. Now, I'm going to segue from that just with this principle in mind and teach what I want to teach this morning. And I'm speaking primarily to the members of our church, okay? If you're visiting, you can still gain a lot of truth from this sermon, but I want to speak to the members of our church. And if you've been coming here for any length of time, if you, I put it this way, if you consider yourself a member of our church, you're a member of our church. We don't keep membership roles, okay? This is a body of Christ here. It's made up of born-again uh, believers, so if you are here today as a believer in Jesus Christ, obviously you're a member of this church right now as we gather together in the body of Christ. But primarily for things being done the way they're done, I'm going to be speaking to those of you who consider yourself to be, you know, members of our church because I want things to be done decently and in order within our church. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, I also want to say this because... You know, I, I, the way that I, that I preach sermons, it, it's very, it is thoughtful, 
And I, and I want you to understand that too. When, when I come up here and prepare a sermon and preach a sermon, there is a lot of thought that goes into it and even how I'm going to deliver a particular sermon I'm going to preach. And oftentimes when I preach on sins, especially certain particular sins, those you might see me get more animated and more angry about those sins. And that is, it's not an accident, but it's also not unnatural. Like it's not, it's not a fake, it's not a circus, it's not a sideshow where I'm up here trying to pretend to be angry about something, right? But I'm allowing the anger of towards sin to, to come forth and just be revealed. And I think that's an appropriate response for, for various subject matters, right? As the Bible says, you know, hey, uh, stamp aloud, you know, cry aloud, stamp with thy fit, stamp with my foot, you know, uh, um, and, and preach, you know, show, and show my people their sin, and show Israel their sin, right? There's, there's, there's other verses in scripture that talk about that style of preaching, that type of preaching, but it's not for every single sermon, right? Like, you're not always just going to be up here ranting and raving and screaming and stuff. And also when it comes to teaching, you know, you don't always teach that way either, right? You want to warn when something is very egregious, very, you know, I, I was ranting and raving about, about fornication. That's a really, really serious sin. And that's something that like, you know, hey, w when you see how angry that makes me because of how bad of a sin it is, because of how destructive that sin is, you, you need that to hit home. It needs to be, have that much force to be like, whoa, okay, this is, this is a little bit different, right? You need, you need to see that, and I think that's an appropriate way of teaching. But what I want to teach about today isn't that, like, as serious in, in that regard, okay? And I'm not going to get all angry about this. And also, what I want to preach on is, is with, with keeping the, the order within the church, I don't want people to, to do this because they would be worried that you're going to make me angry or something, so this truth is, is not about me or be, me being angry. It's about I want everyone to do their best individually. And I'm careful with this, the way, I, the way I'm wording things, because I, I love everyone that comes to our church. And I want you to come, and I want you to keep coming, and I want you to grow, okay, ultimately. And individually, we all have our own areas that we struggle with and we're trying to improve and we're trying to grow and we're trying to do better, right? Hopefully you are, right? I, I mean, I know I am. I'm always trying to, to do things better and trying to improve. And, and I think having that same spirit here, collectively, we all want to do better. We want to improve even as a church, right? I have a vision of our church where I want our church to be the most excellent, the best church just in the world, right? Like that's what I would like to see. Now, how is that going to happen? Well, the church is, collectively, it's you and me. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into a church being awesome, right? Being the best church, being one that, man, I, I, am, I am proud to be part of that church. I love this church. There's so many things I love about this church. And I want that to be shown in all of our actions. And even in the most basic things, Right? Now, we don't force people to do anything in this church, and I don't even want to make it sound like, I, oh, you say you don't force it, but you really do force it. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's not like that, okay? We have ministries here, and you can choose to serve and to do and to help and, and, and to do all the things that we need to get done here. It's still all up to you. I mean, people who play instruments... I'm not forcing anyone to play any musical instruments here. But you know what? It betters everybody when people are playing, right? I love having the piano and the guitars and the flutes and, and every other instrument that people are, are offering up their time and, and serving here. I think that's wonderful. I think it's great. Now, of course, at the end of the day, I'm the administrator of all of that. So I'm going to try to make sure everything, even with the music, is done decently and in order and, and is going to be uh, presented appropriately, Right? But it's still up to you individually to just choose if you want to do that. And there's many other things that we do as a church, even down to just the basic cleaning. Right? And again, with that, that boils down to if you choose to help out or not. No one is forced to do that. No one is forced to do any of the work that you do here. So I don't want to make you think that you have to. However, 
we are here to serve God. We are here, hopefully, to improve and to be the best people that we can be. And as I've, I've been going through kind of this series, it's like this, this it's not an official series, but it, it just seems to be these different subjects keep coming up, in my mind at least, while I'm studying scripture and figuring out what I want to preach on, of characteristic traits and, and, and things that maybe aren't always taught at home, but I think should be taught at home, right? Basic I, I call them basic, but it doesn't have, it's not always in every home having proper manners and having good work ethic and having this type of an, an attitude, right, that could make you a very upstanding, not just an upstanding person or upstanding citizen, but an upstanding Christian, right? Someone that could, that could be a good ambassador for Christ that is going to be very reflective of the qualities that the Bible puts forward as being a Christian, as being a person of God, as being a child of God. You want to be representative of our Holy Father in heaven. And so when I see things within the church, I like to preach on them because it's an opportunity for us to get better. And this is an area where I'm not, like I said, I'm not like angry about it and I don't, and I don't want people to feel compelled that you have to do something good or else Pastor Burns is going to be mad about it. Like, that's not the spirit in which I'm trying to, to put forth this message about this subject. Okay, and I'm going to cover a lot about some of the little things, but there's a lot to, to, to take forward. And, and even in the small things, there's teaching that will apply broadly. And oddly enough, I didn't have this in my, in my sermon notes but I believe it's in Luke, and I just quoted this, I just had to preach on this not that long ago, um, that if, you, if you're not able to handle the, the smallest of matters, like if, if you're not faithful in that which is least, the Bible teaches, hey, who's going to give you that which is, which is great? Right? Like, like, like if you can't even handle someone else's stuff, then, then who's going to give you your own? Right? And, 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 and this is a principle that the Lord uses. He looks to see how people work how you are, how faithful you are in even the smallest of matters to then determine, am I going to give this person more work to do? Now, here's the thing. Like, as, as a believer, as a child of God, we should want to do, hey, I want to do the greatest work for God that I can. I want God to be so pleased with me. I want God to be so happy for me. I want to be able to earn a lot of rewards also in heaven. I want, I want to have him say when, I'm, when I enter into those pearly gates, hey, well done, now good and faithful servant. That, I would love for that to be the case for me personally. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, you got to start humble and you start small. And you have to have the right mindset and the right attitude towards doing work, even on the smallest of matters, even on the little things. Because if you, can be if you can't be faithful in those little things, then why in the world are you going to be entrusted to do anything more? Right? I mean, does that make sense? But if you can show yourself faithful, like, hey, this guy, he'll do anything. I mean, I, I, if I just ask for anything to be done, it gets done. It gets done well. I don't go have to go back there and, and redo the same work that they did or whatever. You know, people can show themselves faithful in that. Then uh, you're going to be promoted to be doing more work. And this is something that we ought to also be teaching our children and start them early. And I try my best. And, you know, again, none of us are perfect. I try my best with my children at home to when you do something, do it good. Do it right. Don't just be in a haste and in a hurry to just, oh, mom said I got to do this. So, and then I'm done and I move on. Right? We want them to do it right. And oftentimes doing things right might take a little bit longer. But everything that we do, we ought to be doing it as if we're serving the Lord. And I'll get to that verse in a little bit. That's coming up a little bit later in the sermon. But I had you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse number 14, the Bible reads, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And there's just a few points here out of these couple of verses I want to I just highlight. And that's one, the, the, the holiness of church, right? The sanctity of church itself and the importance of church is that he says, look, I, you need to know how to behave yourself in the house of God. 
And look, this is New Testament. He's not just talking about like the Old Testament temple or tabernacle. He's talking about the church of the living God, which is <laughs> what the next phrase clarifies even further. The, the, the house of God is the church of the living God, which also is, by the way, the pillar and ground of the truth. So this is the church is the place where people ought to be able to come to and say, hey, this is the pillar. This is the ground of the truth. You want to come and hear the truth? Come on into church. This is a place that should be ready to, to distribute the truth to people. And you know what? Though we need to be able to, to know how we ought to behave ourselves then, because this is also the house of God. I mean, if you were to go over to someone else's house, right? And we should be raising our children. You go over to a guest's house. You go over to someone else's house. There's a certain uh, level of behavior that's expected out of them, right? Now, at home, things might be a little bit different. You're more comfortable. You get away with some more stuff. You kind of let your hair down a little bit, and the kids are able to do some more things, maybe be a little bit more wild and, and whatever at home in that setting. That's appropriate. But when you leave your house and you go to someone else's house, there's a different behavior pattern that's expected. And again, I know if, if for many of you this may be like, Pastor Burns, why are you even saying this? I'm saying this because it needs to be taught in church. Because unfortunately, oftentimes it's not taught at home and in the family, or sometimes we forget about it and we become slack in our responsibilities as parents on how we ought to be raising our children. And when you come to church, we should view church as the house of God. Okay, we're coming into God's house. Now, no matter, like, if you're invited to someone else's house, you'll probably have a different level of behavior depending on how you view that person as well, right? I mean, if you get invited to, like, I think of me as a man, to just a friend's house, you'll be more comfortable. The way that you behave is going to be different than, say, when I get invited to my boss's house at work. Right? I, I have an employer, I work for a CEO of a company, so when he invites me over to my house, I'm going to behave a particular way because of who he is. And it just makes sense. Or if you were get invited to some, you know, maybe, maybe someone that has some other type of status or whatever, you're going to go over to the house. Or someone who's just more of a stranger to you and isn't as close, you're going to be just really making sure you got your good manners and you're, and you're appropriate in all that you say and do. Well, we ought to look at our church, while, while it is a church family here, and I love the feeling of family. Amen. That's great. We ought to have that. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ought to be comfortable with, with one another and love one another and be there for one another. But don't forget that when we come in as a church, though, we're coming into the house of God. Amen. Right? So this is God's house. And it's not, it's, it's not about the, the paint and the walls and that, that stuff. Right? We're, we're, we're not, it's not about this building but the church is the house of God. And we need to remember that. We come here, we sing praises to the Lord. We bring forth the truth of God's word. It, it is a serious thing that we're doing, right? And it's something that's going to be guiding our life. And we ought to have the reverence and respect when we come to this place and treat it as if you're walking in the house of God. Because that is what the church is here. The church is the people, but at the same time, we're gathered together. This is a church. So we ought to be doing our best to say, hey, let's, you know, for example, pick up after ourselves. I'm in the house of God. Now, we may feel real comfortable here because we are, we, it, this is literally family, and, and I love that about our church. That's one of the best things about our church, I think, is how much and how close people are within our church. And again, if you're visiting, hopefully you, you feel that and understand that. And it's not just a click, and we're not just looking at visitors going like, look, I've been to churches like that. Everyone just knows each other. And you just feel like the oddball out and like, okay, well, I'll just go now, <laughs> right? That's not how this church is. I mean, people are real friendly and opening and warm. And I love that. It's great. And we ought to have that. But it needs to also be balanced with we can have this great communion together. We can have this great fellowship. And at the same time, still have the proper behavior and, you know, be able to Keep things decent and in order. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5, please.
And I'm not going to get super detailed on all the trivial things that could come up. Okay, that's not as important as the mindset. Right? I'm not going to point out some, you left this water bottle over here, and I kicked it over, and it made a big, you know, like, like that's not, and that actually didn't even happen, so. <laughs> For anyone thinking that, that, no, that didn't even happen. I'm just making stuff up, right? Like, it's not, it's not about these little, the little details, specifically. But it is about the details just personally, right? So, so how am I going to do things better in church? Now, and there's, there's many areas. It's not just about cleaning. It's about everything, okay? Cleaning is the smallest of the matters, though. Like, if we, if we can't keep our place, you know, looking decent and in order, and visitors come in, what's it going to look like to the visitor? I mean, you can't even, like, like, is this church really being done decent and in order? Doesn't look like that, that scripture of a church, even if it's just some of the, the, the smallest things, but, like, you know, you got trash all over the place, and there's crumbs everywhere, and things are sticky, and you try to turn, you know, it's like, Come on, what, we, we can do better than that, right? But ab above that, too, you know, we want to be able to um, do well by one another and have, have good relationships with each other here, too, right? Um, Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And I'll get into the relationship thing again just a little bit later. I was getting a little bit ahead of myself. But in Ephesians 5, verse 14, 15, 16, it's bringing up the fact, he's saying, look, awake thou that sleepest. Right? First of all, we shouldn't be lazy, sleeping, like not doing anything. He says you need to walk circumspectly. You know, you need, you need to be aware, you need to be upright, not as fools, but as wise. And this is redeeming the time. And, man, especially this week, attending two funerals, we really need to redeem our time. We don't know what a day is going to bring. And, 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 you know, sadly this week, both of those funerals were, were for people that, that really did not live out their days as you, we might expect normally on this earth. Okay, they were both um, cut short. Okay, now thankfully, both are, have a testimony of salvation, so they have eternal life. So they're never going to truly die. They've passed on and they're with the Lord. So that's, that's obviously very good news. But, it, but for those of us that are here, right, well, hey, when, when I pass on, I'm going to just be happy. I'm going to be full of joy, Right? <laughs> Now, all the, all the aches, all the pains, all the stress, all the, the grief, the sorrow, anything that goes along with this life is gone, right? So, so, so I'll just be happy, right? But the people that are left behind, you know, you have to, to still do things, right? And as much like the Apostle Paul said, hey, uh, to me, for me to live as Christ and, uh, and die as gain, right? Our brother Logan just quoted that to me this morning. It was, you know, it's a great verse to live by. But he says, you know, I, I'd rather depart here and be with the Lord. It's far better, right? It's far better to be with Christ, but it's necessary for you to, to be here, right? So we all have a mission. We all have a, a job from the Lord to, to do work here. So because of that, we, we ought to be say, okay, hey, look, I'm going to be mindful. I'd much rather just, just die and go to heaven, but God's got work for me to do, and it's to serve others because that's Christ's mission. If we Christ-like, Christ lived here on this earth to serve others. Literally, his entire ministry was about serving others. And with the ultimate sacrifice, of course, of himself, dying for the world. So we have a mission to serve. We have a mission to do for others. Not to accumulate a bunch of wealth for ourselves here on this earth, to live for others. That is our goal. And knowing and, and being aware Hey, our time is short still. God's got a lot of work for us to do, but the time is short. We need to redeem that time. We need to redeem it. And oftentimes, you know, we end up wasting time and wasting opportunities when you could be doing more and maybe you just didn't plan. Maybe, 
you know, there's all kinds of different reasons. Maybe your flesh is just going, hey, don't, don't do that. And you kind of give in to the flesh. But you, you end up wasting opportunities to do good. And, and I would say, you know, to get real specific here, there's, there's one area that I've seen probably the, the most wasted opportunity. And again, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not trying to beat anyone up here. But when you make a whole day out of coming to church, because many people do, you come in the morning and you'll stick around for the evening services. And, and I love that. It's great. And I'm happy that you're doing that. But there's oftentimes a time in between where you may not feel like there's much to do. Right? And a lot of people just end up hanging out and just hanging out and talking and sitting around. But in fact, there's a lot of things to do in that time. It's up to you to do it, right? I'm not saying that, that you, you, you have to do anything. But if you're going to dedicate a day to serving the Lord, to me it just makes sense that maybe you should also think about, hey, what else can I do? And what can I do to serve? And what can I do to help the cause of Christ and to help this church to, to do its function, right? And many people have very good reasons why they stick back here. And there's oftentimes a lot of younger children and things like that that like, it makes perfect sense. Look, I'm not trying to, to judge you for sticking back, but you know, we do have a soul winning time that takes place in between the church services, which would be one very good use of time if you're able-bodied and, you and there's no reason not to go. I would encourage you just to consider that and think like, hey, maybe, maybe I'll start doing this. Like this would be a great use of my time instead of just sort of wasting my time and just kind of hanging out and really doing nothing. I'm just sitting here anyways. You might as well go out, might as well join us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I think it's a great use of time. But also, like I said, I understand and, and maybe not everyone wants to and I'm not gonna, you never would force anything. I don't even force my, you know, my children really. Every once in a while, I'll make them go out with me just to get the experience. But you know, that's something in my family that I, I want that to be an individual desire to want to go and serve the Lord and want to go soul winning because your heart has to be in it. You can't just, like if you force someone to try to come out with you, like that's not going to do them any good. Your heart's got to be there. You got to want to do that. So instilling that desire is, is much better. I'm just throwing this out there saying, hey, are you really redeeming your time when you just kind of sit around and do nothing? Is that really the best use of your time? And sure, there's always time to fellowship, but you know what? You can fellowship. Those of us that go out soul winning, we do some fellowship. We were fellowshipping this last week, right? We had lots, plenty of time to talk and, 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 and talk about things that matter and, and also go out and, and give people the gospel. I think you could, you could do more than one thing at a time. I'd say similarly, you know, if you're sitting back here in between the services, you can also fellowship and hang out and maybe help straighten things up so that way when people get back from soul winning the same people putting forth the labor out there don't have to come forth and then do even more labor labor here to make sure that everything's getting done yeah. right i mean it, to me it just makes sense and again i'm not trying to beat anyone up but just i just you know oftentimes here and here's the thing if i don't point it out you know you might not even think about it I mean, there's so many times where I've just been like, I just, you do things, you don't even think about it. And then as soon as it's brought up, it's like, oh man, yeah, I do do that. Or, or maybe I could improve this area. So this is, this is why I bring it up. It's not to, you know, not to just beat you up, but, but just to you thinking about it, right? Um, and also with the children, right? Train up, it's a good opportunity to train children. If you're sticking back because you have children, it's a good opportunity to train them a little bit. It doesn't have to be this big intensive thing for, for hours on end, but it's a great opportunity to say, hey, Look, we're, we're in, we're not at home. You've been playing here, now you need to pick this up and you need to, to take care of that, right? And, and teach them to take care after themselves. And the, you know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. I, I believe that firmly. And, and it starts with you being diligent, especially as parents, to, to teach your children. Uh, turn if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. There's a concept here that, that is going to be loosely applied, I'll admit it, to, to what I'm preaching on this morning. But I think it's still fair. In 2 Corinthians 9, what we're going to see, and we're going to read a significant portion of this, of this chapter, is 
the support of those who are ministering the word. And in the context here, as you'll see, this is referring to some physical support of like, like, like monetarily, right? This is them giving to help support a ministry that's being done to preach the gospel, okay? But supporting those who do the work can go beyond just a financial gain or financial benefit to be given, right? There's plenty of ways to be in support of those who are doing that. And why am I even bringing this up? Well, because as I mentioned in the announcements, you know, this is, the soul winning is, is the biggest and most important effort that our church does. It is the lifeblood of this church. We care about this the most. And I would say this, even those who, for whatever reason, right, choose not to go out on a given day, but you have all this time, how about you spend some of that time in prayer? And pray for the soul winners that are out there and, and, and going forth and putting forth the, the work. Hey, not everyone. And, and, you know, sometimes there's people of different physical conditions and other ailments and other things. And, you know, there's all hosts of reasons. Right? And I would never ask someone individually, hey, why aren't you going? Like, that's none of my business. It's none of my business. Okay, and I won't look down on you either. That's, that's totally up to you. This sermon is just meant to, to push you a little bit, maybe to think about and say, hey, is there something else that I could be doing? Can I be doing more? Can I be helping more? However I'm using my time, am I making the best use out of it? Or am I really just wasting it all together? And this is something that in children, you have to teach this to them and kind of instill this mindset Stop wasting your time. Stop wasting your time. You know, your time is valuable. Your time is precious. We need to redeem our time. And, and I'll tell you what, because unfortunately for me, I've wasted a lot of time in my youth. Lots of time. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of time. I'm not just talking about when I was like real. I'm talking about into adulthood. I wasted tons of time in adulthood. Just with vanity. Just vain things. Just spending hours and days and weeks and months and years ultimately just kind of living for fun and living for myself and I, I you know I'd love to get that time back but you know what about time you can't get it back and then when it finally clicks you start doing things like man I need to get I'm trying to get more done then you really realize how little time you have when you actually start trying to do something it's like man I got these goals I want to get this I want to get this done Oh, good night. And then the older you get, it seems like the, the less time you have and the harder it gets. So look, it is a valuable thing. And we need to be teaching our children to make the most and to redeem their time. Now, in 2 Corinthians 9, let's start reading here because this is in support of the soul winners. The Bible says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. So if you didn't follow all of that, basically what he's saying is concerning, touching the ministering to the saints, so that they're, they're helping the saints He's like, I don't even need to write this to you. And, and, he's, and he's exalting the church at Corinth. He's saying, like, you guys have been great. You're awesome. You've been very supportive. In fact, I've been boasting about you to the, the church of Macedonia. I've been telling them how great of a church you guys, and you guys are really supportive. You support missions. You do all this stuff. You're great. And he's like, he's like I still sent some people there just to make sure you're ready. You know that we're coming and that I've been telling them how great you guys are at supporting, right? So when we get there... You're willing, you, you've got things to help us with and you're ready to support us when we get there, right? Because then it would be pretty embarrassing. We show up and we've just been talking you up. You've been, oh yeah, man, these guys are great. They, they help out with anything they can. And, and then we show up and they're like, well, we don't really have anything for you, right? This is, this is my, inter, my, you know, my, uh, my version of, of, this, of this passage here, my, giving my uh, understanding here. Verse number four, um, or verse number five, excuse me. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty. So this is their, what they're going to give, right? They're, they're giving. So they're going to take up a collection. They're going to take up an offering for the saints 
that need it that are doing the work. Whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And this is just a simple truth, right? He's talking about so, you know, sowing seed. If, you, if you're going to sow just a little bit, well, don't expect to reap much. And the only way you're going to be able to reap a lot, you've got to sow a lot, right? So what they're doing, though, here, as we're going to see in just a minute, is their support is basically helping to supply the seed and to supply all the materials and the resources for them to go out and sow. The sowers are going forth and sowing, but we want to be able to get the seed to them. We want to be able to get the whole, the whole supply chain for them to be out on the field doing the work, right? That all needs to be there so that they can have the most seed to sow. And everybody that's involved in that process will be blessed and God will recognize the work that you do in, in all of that area. Not just the sower, but everyone that's involved in that whole process is, is it's valuable. Verse 7, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. And look, this wasn't a requirement. He said, look, you, you decide for yourself. Just understand this concept. Hey, if you, you know, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do as you purpose in your heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And this is the way that I try to approach all of these matters in our church with whether it be soul winning or giving or anything like that. Look, you want to help out our missions program? Great. But don't do it like you have to. Do it because you want to. You want to go out soul winning, you know. Now we are, <laughs> the Bible does say that, that we are, you know, we are to go soul winning. Like that is something that, that God has called for us to do and he's entrusted us with that. And that is a work that, that God has ordained to be done. But it's not something that I command. Right? Like the, the Bible commands that. The Lord commands that. Right? You choose, just like any other commandment out of the Scripture, you know, I don't demand you to do things. You choose what you're going to obey and what you're not going to do in Scripture. But um, I digress a little bit. Let's continue here. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad. He hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So that's the person who's ministering the seed to the sower. That's the guy who's, who's supplying them, right? Um, and he's talking about the, the blessing there, the multiplying of the seed, the increasing of the fruits of your righteousness. Verse 11, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. So we see there in 2 Corinthians 9, as I mentioned, you know, he's talking about bringing a bounty to them. But the people involved in making sure that that ministry goes forward and is successful all play a very important role. And it's all going to be helpful to bringing forth the most fruit. And, and even here, you know, if, if we have to cut things short from, if the sowers have to cut things short from preaching the gospel because they know that when they come back, hey, we still have the house of God here to clean up and to, and to get in order and make it all decent and ready to go. Well, there's that, that now it's taking back from the work. Whereas other people can say, hey, you know what? They're going out and doing this. Maybe I could stick back and do this. And, you know, a few other th maybe common issues with a large group of people in general. What we oftentimes see is you might have only one or two people doing a lot of work and a lot of people doing nothing. And again, you know, I understand people are going to get burned out and, and just realize that too, that, the one or two people that are always doing everything, they might get burned out and they might choose not to do it anymore. Well, how about we support those people by not requiring them to do all the work all the time? 
And that becomes apparent real quick when one or two people are always doing all the work and then those people aren't here. It becomes very obvious. And I'll just say this, it has become obvious in the past couple of weeks. So um, I encourage you to help where you can. Acts chapter 6, we're almost done. We're almost done. And I'll reiterate this as well. There's many re different reasons to do things. I think the best reason is just to be the best Christian that you could be, the best worker, the best example, the best, you know, teach your children the best way to say, hey, look, we're going to make the best use of our time everywhere. And not even just here at church, but like everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Every day of your life, let's make the best use of our time. I'm not saying there's never a time to just have fun. And, and we have fellowships here. Right? We have fellowships within church where we all gather together and we'll have a fellowship and say, okay, we're going to, we had a movie night. We're going to come together. We're going to watch this, this, this film on creation and, you know, we're going to hang out. We're going to enjoy each other. But then it's, okay, now it's time to clean up and, and get everything put together. Right? So there's, there's time and a place for everything. But there's so many moments in your life that, that you could end up just not making the most effective use of. And you could get a little bit out of bounds and out of balance with the amount of work that you even do, right? We, we don't always, everything isn't just always about having fun. We ought to be concerned about the work that's being done as well. And what we see here in Acts chapter 6 is that the church grew, you know, our church is growing, but not near what the church of Jerusalem was growing during this time, especially early on in the book of Acts, where, I mean, thousands of people were being added to the Lord, and the church was growing tremendously by leaps and bounds, they have multiple pastors at these churches. They have, you know, this huge uh, uh, amount of people who are getting saved, and these churches are growing. And we pick up here in verse number one, the Bible says, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So this was kind of a new thing because there's so many Greeks now, these Grecians, that were getting saved and joining the church, which really wasn't happening en masse prior to the disciples being sent forth and just preaching the gospel to every creature um, as they started to in the book of Acts after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now you've got a whole bunch more people. The church is growing and they're saying, hey, we've got, we, we've got widows now. They're, yeah, we're new to church or whatever, but, but now there's all these people that, that could use help is what they're saying. We, we've got these widows that could use the help of the church and uh, this, this, this ministry of, of helping out the widows, they were like, you know, our, our widows are being neglected here. So this becomes an issue. Verse 2 says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So what, what they're establishing here is that, look, they've got a particular function. They've got a job that they need to focus on. And it makes the most sense for the apostles to give themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word, right? So the, 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 the great spiritual matters, the, the word of God that needs to be expounded and taught and preached, like that is something that not everybody has the skill or capability to do, right? They've been blessed with these gifts from God to be able to do this, and there's only so many hours in a day, Amen. right? So the best use of their time is to do that skilled work as opposed to just go and help feed someone maybe or help support those who are in need. And they're not saying that those jobs aren't important. Of course they are. And in fact, they, you know, they still have a good criteria on the people they want doing that work. They say, look, let's find seven men of honest report, right? So good people, good, honest people. They're upright people. They're full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, right? They're not just, just some, you know, just random person who's like, like hey, come in. Hey, you want to just help take care of our widows? Yeah, thanks. You know, like, no, this is, this is important. We want to get 
the right people. We want to get people that are wise. We want to get people full of the Holy Ghost. But then they can be appointed over this business and make sure it gets done properly and they can care for the people and it's an important job. But there's this, and again, the bigger the organization gets, the more you need to have these you know, people kind of segmented doing these various tasks. And why do I bring this up? Well, I bring this up because at the end of the day, as a pastor of this church, I'm responsible for everything. Everything. Everything that gets done here, I am responsible for all of it. And I'm happy to take on that job. I like that job. That's why I became a pastor, right? And I actually like it more as the years go by. I love, I love pastoring a church. And I'm not complaining about it either. Like, it's fine, but it's important to understand that when things don't get done, I have to do it. Like, there is no, there is no well, it can't get done. Well, no, I'm not going to allow it not to be done because I need to make sure, also, I'm responsible to make sure everything's done decently and in order in this church. So not getting done is not an option for me. And that's not the way this church is going to be presented. But I do bring it up just to, to th be thoughtful about it and say, hey, do we want Pastor Burzens having to worry and focus on the menial tasks here because the more of that I have to do, the, literally the less time I have to prepare the sermons and do other work for the church. Uh, there's only so many hours in a day. And, and this is what's being expressed here in Acts chapter 6, and I would express the same thing here as well. And as I mentioned before, even with people going out soul winning, you know, if, there's, if other people are willing to do these tasks, amen, I'm glad for that. But the more we all come together as members, and the Bible talks about every single person, you have value. Everybody does. You, you can help in so many different ways. And, and look, I don't, especially for people who are coming visiting, we have so many people that help out in so many areas, okay? This is not like we have a bunch of lazy people that aren't doing anything here. No, there's tons of people that invest their time. This is just, this is a, 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 a something that I noticed that I just want to make sure everybody's on board, everybody's thinking about it, and, and that we're aware of what's going on around us to get the most done. And to, and to think of yourself, hey, look, I love this church. I care about this church. I'm a member of this church. I'm going to do what I can to serve, right? And, and I think the be, you know, one of the ways we're going to have the best church is when we can have the most people who come here not thinking, hey, what is this church going to do for me? What do you got? What programs do you have for me? What are you going to give me? What are you going to, you know? That's not going to make the church flourish when, when you got a whole bunch of people with that attitude. But at the opposite, though, saying, hey, what can I do to give? What can I do to support? What can I do to help? Right? What, what can we do to get, to get the work of God done? That's what's going to make this church awesome and flourish. And look, as people grow and, and, and people are new Christians, there's going to be people in all different walks of life, and they're not all going to have the same attitude and, and whatever. And, and you know what? That's fine. And we're going to support the weak, as the Bible says that we should. And we're going to comfort the feeble-minded. We're going we're to help people along their way and their path and help them to grow. And not everyone has had the same upbringing. Not everyone has had the same values taught to them. And not everybody, you know, knows all of these things. And it's fine to not know them, but we want to help you to grow and help you to learn and help you, you know, just, just give that guidance. Anything that's been missed out of, out of the wisdom of, of the Bible, the wisdom of Scripture, we're going to try to help people to grow. And as I said, I'm not, it's not like I, you know, I, I love that, everyone, that people come here, and I'm glad they feel comfortable enough to come, and I, and I want you to come. And even if you don't you know, serve in some way, I still want you to be able to come back to church, and, and I want you to learn from the, from the preaching of God's Word. I want you to be uh, edified by the fellowship, by the people around you, okay? And, and I want you to grow and, and just become a better Christian overall. So again, you know, like there's no requirement on what you have to do. It's just uh, uh, to get you to think and, and choose what you want to do, if you want to help or not. And finally, because I think these two topics are a little bit related, <laughs> Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. I 
I bring this stuff up, but I don't want there to, to be any resentment or bitterness or gossiping or backbiting within the church. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of different personalities here. And like I said, you get more people in together. There's bound to be friction at times. And there's going to be people who say things that you think are rude. And there's going to be people who do things or not do things or whatever that's going to be easy to take offense at. And, and we ought to have here the right spirit of long-suffering, forgiveness, and being able to just endure. And I, and I would say this, hey, sure, people say rude things. People say rude things to me. Sometimes regularly. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but we need to grow. And, and look, spiritual maturity and growth, you, want, you, you need to be able to, to allow that and suffer that. And just say, okay. You know, and not give a, a, a tit for tat. Not give a, a, you know, oh, you said this to me, now I'm going to say this to you. Or, or can you believe what this person said about me? Or said, you know, like, look, we don't need that. And the Bible says that stuff is wrong. Okay, the gossiping, the busybody, the, the talking about other people and back and forth, it, it's not going to do anyone any good. It doesn't. So if people have their own issues and their own problems and maybe they're not doing something or maybe they're causing a little bit of issue here or there, you know what, we need to be able to kind of look past that, give a little bit of grace, okay, and just keep doing what we know is right. Now, there's always ways of dealing with people and interactions and, you know, it's a good idea to, if someone is causing a problem with you, to, to talk to them personally about it. Okay, if you have a problem with them, but here's the thing, if you have a problem with someone, you don't talk to anyone else about them, you talk to them about the problem. You don't need to be talking to someone else that you have a problem with someone else. But you just deal with that. Deal with that yourself. Okay, and, and do it in a Christian way, right? Because we want to have good relationships here with everybody. We're brothers and sisters in, in all households. I know this. I've got six children. So <laughs> brothers and sisters don't always get along <laughs> as much as we'd want them to, especially when they're young and immature. You know, a lot of times as you get older, the, the, the siblings that didn't get along that well when they were younger tend to get along better when they're mature. And you know what? Christians are the same thing. A lot of times you get people who, Christians, that haven't been Christians very long. You know, they haven't been saved very long. They haven't, they haven't known a lot of things very long. And they might be a little uh, harder to deal with than people are more mature. But um, nonetheless, we need to have the right spirit. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 8. The Bible says this, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Or just common courtesy. Just be, be courteous to people, right? It's, re it's a real simple message. How would you like to be spoken to or addressed? You do the same for them. It's courtesy, right? It's respect. Let's, let's show that amongst one another. If someone has a problem with you, do you want them going around and talking to a bunch of people about it? No. Do you want them to, to tell you about it? Because, and again, oftentimes, and this was, who, Brother Jared, we were talking about this yesterday. No, Brother Jess, sorry. We, we, I talked about this yesterday. It was with Brother Jess. Oftentimes, there, there's like, People have this, this impression or a false understanding based on, on nothing. So uh, the, the situation we were talking about was like one person thought that they weren't really welcomed over here. And then the other people felt like, oh, they never want to be around us. So like there's this, this friction that literally just came from no communication. And like people kind of have this stuff worked up in their heads about how other people think about them and how they feel about them. And, and there was really nothing there yeah. at all. And they both were just thinking about the other person thinking like, oh, I don't think they really want to be around me. And it's like that wasn't true at all, right? That was you, Brother Jess? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, 
you know, so, so we, want an, <laughs> we want that not to happen as much as, as much as we can. So we need to be able to communicate, uh, be pitiful, be courteous, love as brethren. Verse 9 says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, right? Someone rails against you and says, you know, accusing you falsely of something. You don't just turn right back around now and say, well, I'm going to, you know, well, you know, they blah, blah, blah. Like, you, you don't do that. But contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Last place to turn, Colossians chapter 3. And I would say for the, to, to, to kind of dovetail on that, you know, remember, none of us are perfect. <laughs> Whatever people do to annoy you, you probably annoy someone else with, with something that you do. Right? Not because you necessarily want to or try to, but because we're not perfect. So be mindful of that so that you can be courteous and you can have grace and long-suffering towards those that, um, you know, maybe, and maybe honestly just behave that the way they shouldn't. But hey, we're brothers and sisters of Christ here. We need, we're, we, we, we're here for common goal. We're trying to work together in unity to, to get the most work done, right? And if there's problems, we need to just work through them. Colossians chapter 3, though, and this is, this is the last mindset I'm going to leave you with. Because, as I mentioned before, I, I would love, I, I think our church is excellent, and I want this church to just get better and better and better. And I want people to know, especially visitors, especially people that we, we meet for the first time, that we take our faith seriously. And we take our faith seriously in, in all areas, right? Not, not just that it is, our, ser our faith is seriously in Christ as our Savior, but also, like, in, in the Bible itself. Right? So while, while we aren't perfect and we do have failure and we, we, we will end up showing hypocrisy in some area of our life because we're not perfect, by and large, though, we should still be marked as people who do care about the Word of God and are, and are tr continually tr striving to improve and make the changes necessary to get us more in line with God's Word, more conformed to the image of Christ and, and doing what we ought to be doing. Colossians 3, verse 22, the Bible says this, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. We're all servants to Christ. I'm not speaking to you today as your master and you serve me and you have to worry. No, we're all servants of Christ, you and me together. We serve the Lord. And we ought to think about that. And look, our whole life belongs to him. And the Bible says that we ought to be um, profitable servants. And, and that really we ought to, to present a living sacrifice, which the Bible says is our reasonable service to him. I mean, we owe everything to the Lord. He, he bought us and paid for us with a price, with the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Okay, we, we, owe, him, we owe him everything. So we should happily serve. But also just keep in mind, hey, as we go about our life, you know, we, we're, it's, it's not only in church. It's not only in one particular time or setting. He owns our whole life, our whole being. So let's, let's be honorable. Let's be faithful and show our faith to the Lord and in everything that we do, everything that we do, let's just do whatever we do as if we're serving Christ himself anyways, because ultimately we really are. So even if you work for someone else, even if you, you, know, you have other jobs, you should do your work that's representative of being a child of God as if you're just serving God directly. And, and you know, with that mindset, with that at the forefront of our minds, you know, we will succeed. We will succeed. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for all the, the truth and the wisdom that we could find in your word. And, and I pray that you would please help us to redeem our time and to use it um, 
to the best of our abilities, dear Lord, and to be mindful of, of ser our service to you. And God, I pray that you please just help our church to continue to grow. You've blessed us tremendously. Help us to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the, the, the biggest effort that we're putting forth here. Help us to get that other church planted so we can continue to do even more work in another area, dear Lord, and, and just reach that many more people. We need you. We need your power. We need your spirit to guide us. And to lead the way, Lord, we love you. And I thank you so much for our church here. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.